I'd like to introduce you and welcome Ms. Maya Wiley. <laughs> Maya, Bellini. wonderful to see you. It's wonderful to see you. Thank you so much for being here tonight. Well, you asked, you knew I was going to come. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate that. <laughs> but we are here almost 100 years into Black History Month. <laughs> Right. We've been at this, over, this been at this over 100, almost 100 years now, 1926. And we're fighting a little bit harder for it this year. <laughs> and, we're still, and we're still fighting for it and fighting for it a little bit harder. And so I want to start, you know, we're going to take a quick journey tonight because I know this is a quick conversation for all that we could talk about. And I want to talk about your journey. I want to start with the personal and then we can get to the institutional. But tell us a little bit about what put you on this path. You've done everything from the individual activism to the institutional structural change. Tell us about what put you on this journey. You know, I, this is such an important question and I, I there's such a temptation to answer it, give it a simple answer. Uh, and in some ways it is simple. It's, I've been black all my life. Um, and it is that simple, but it's also, of course, nothing is that simple because we all make a lot of choices and do a lot of things with our talents and our and the opportunities that have been handed for us and that we forge for ourselves. But you know, for me, I think what was so formative is having parents who were active in the civil rights movement, um, father who was at the forefront of the economic justice movement, and in a movement family. You know, I was a little kid, but family activities were protests. Family activities were rallies. Family activities were sit-ins, uh, and that that was that direct confrontation of injustice was such a central point in our household because the meetings happened at home. <laughs> you know, it's like you know, you're you're. It's not just something your parents leave the house and go do. It's who your aunties and uncles are, and who you are surrounded by, and who you're eating meals with, and what phone calls are going on when you're sitting on the lap, and and what your family activities are. And, and I think most importantly, the way my parents chose to live, including living in a black neighborhood uh, and sending me to the neighborhood, segregated, underfunded, overcrowded public schools. So I you know, saw firsthand what it means to be in a society that says that black people aren't worth it. Mm -hmm. um, but also to be amongst leaders, including a lot of black women who also happen to be on welfare, who were standing up and saying, we are not only worth it, we're going to make you show us and give us our dignity. And, and that really was very formative for me. And so you've made choices. You've mentioned choices. Um, you've chosen to take on some really as I said, intractable issue. <laughs> I mean, you oh, I, don't about believe, I don't believe in intractable issues. OK. Okay. I don't, that is something we have to take out of our vocabulary. Okay. Because you know what? I think people probably said slavery was intractable. Mm. I think people probably said, mm -hmm. you know, uh, at voting rights in 1965, that that was an intractable problem. Now, right. we're back to fighting and, you know, we always have retrenchment. The fight doesn't stop. But that's really mm -hmm. not the same thing as intractable. And there's no problem that we have created in this society mm -hmm. that doesn't have a solution. The question is how we build the will, mm -hmm. uh, how we build the coalitions, how we build the strategy, how we build the activism mm -hmm. that gets it done. And sometimes it takes years. I mean, it's a marathon, not a sprint, but it is not intractable. Too much. Our folks, and I mean our folks over generations, mm -hmm. who, who confronted the quote unquote, impossible, the intractable, and made it tractable. So we actually have to use that mindset. So let's talk about that because you talk about segregated schools and in 2020, you were still fighting for integrated schools in New York, not in the South, yeah. in New York. Um, we talk, you just, I just heard you speak about the Supreme Court's ruling on, on gerrymandering in Alabama. We're still fighting for voting rights. And so there's this progress for it and this movement back. Um, where do you think we are and, and, and particularly from a political and legal perspective, where do you think we are and how is it different now? Well, you know, first of all, I think it is, it, you know, one of the ways I hold on to hope besides <laughs> holding on to people who are hopeful <laughs> because there are people who are in it, who are suffering in ways that I'm not. 
and suffering in ways that you're not, uh, but they're not stopping. And so that's such as important to recognize, right? It's, it is, we who are privileged do not get to say it's too hard. Um, but I think at the other hand is, is actually having some sense of that history, right? Because you know, the reality of school segregation wasn't that we didn't make progress. Mm -hmm. It's that after Ronald Reagan won in 1980, <laughs> started pushing and, and, and over the course of the 80s and reshaping the federal courts, we actually saw a retrenchment mm -hmm. from a lot of the gains that had been where there was a consent decree, where there was a fight, <laughs> where there was activism organizing, where there was political will, uh, where there was coalition, that there actually had been progress made. Um, and so many people we know, uh, people I revere, or people I work with in city government, like Zach Carter, who was mm -hmm. the corporation counsel when I was council of the mayor, you know, were beneficiaries of that to a certain right. degree, right? So it really, it's, it's important because I think it becomes hard across the generations sometimes to remember that mm -hmm. the progress was being made and people benefited. And it's part of how we started to create a black middle class, for example. Mm -hmm. But yes, there was retrenchment. Mm -hmm. And so where we are right now, frankly, has been, we've been in a long process of retrenchment, really. I would so I started marking from 1980. Not that it all happened overnight, mm -hmm. but, I, but, but you know, we've also had periods of hope Mm -hmm. and, and forward movement, even even in some hard times. So where we are right now, look, like we've got to be, we've got to confront this honestly. You know, we have a Supreme Court that is committed to overruling precedent that that we had won. And and I and I'm gonna I'm talking about the courts, but remember the courts are a political body in the sense that politicians who win elective office appoint them. Okay. So, you know, you have to see a relationship to who's on the bench and elections. And okay. you have to see a relationship between elections uh, and, and how we build power. Because a lot of the times when we have won, it's because we have built that power, right? Mm -hmm. And we have utilized it. Mm -hmm. And we've utilized it strategically uh, and that there has been movement. And I would say that, so we're in dark times. Uh, you know, what we have seen is, you know, some some positive things have happened. And I think it's important to recognize that. I mean, we've been in the midst of COVID, uh, Black, Latinos, Native Americans, highest death rates for some very obvious reasons from not having healthcare to overcrowded housing, uh, to not being able to get access to, uh, to being in jobs that are more likely to force them to work and make them susceptible to actually contracting COVID. But when you think about all these things that have happened, you know, at the same time, you know, we saw a reduction in child poverty, 40% reduction in child poverty, because we had an administration that said, we're going to pump almost $2 uh, billion into reducing it, right? Into just putting cash into people's pockets. Mm -hmm. And that included people of color, <laughs> included Black folks. Yeah. Um, so it, it is demonstrated in a very short period of time that it works. Mm -hmm. So, you know, our task now is really to understand what it means to be the, that, that bridge generation, right? Because we've also seen a, a resurgence of movement times. And we saw it before mm -hmm. Donald Trump. And we, saw, we started seeing it with Trayvon Martin. That's right. Okay. So uh, Black Lives Matter didn't just, you know, appear one day that was also based in organizing that predated the, the murder of Trayvon Martin, right. but building to what became Eric Garner, Awfully, and uh, George Floyd, but and Michael Brown and all, all too many others, we don't mm -hmm. have enough time to name. But that, but that movement was real and, and, and the fact that there were allies who were not black in that movement was real too. And it's not gone, even if the news cycle's not paying attention to it. It, it, even if we are in trouble in other ways. And that's only one measure of movement, but I just wanted to call that out because we, because what that means is we've got building blocks and that building blocks includes that kind of movement, that kind of activism uh, and the relationships that it's been building over years and the way that women of all races have been organizing and, and many other, uh, and economic justice. Uh, but what it does require us to recognize is we are um, and have been entering movement times, I would argue, but we also have all the challenges that movement times always confront, right? Which is the strategy, which is what are the policies to fight for and how, which is the coalition to build and push for them. 
Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, and, and how we do that is something we're all going to need to confront together, mm -hmm. uh, but it does matter. Um, and I would just say that, you know, that's what we have to be here for. And we have to just remember the long history of where it has, what it has gained us in the past and where it can take us in the future. And I think that, I think that's an interesting point because this idea of, you know, you talk about power and there's very, there's different domains of power, right? We're not just talking about political power, but what, are the, what is the power that sits in communities, right? I think that when we talk about movement work, a lot of it is grounded in the community. And some of that, you know, the end result is political. Some of the end result is volume, but a lot of that power is not necessarily just about what people are doing at the polls. It's not about elected officials. You've been on the front lines, Maya, in both, right? You, I saw you out there. <laughs> you went on the front lines of both. And can you talk a little bit about the different types of power and how people can wield their power in different spheres? Because it's yeah. not just about others, the elected officials. If we don't get that office, we can't move things forward. No, absolutely, absolutely. And and the reality is you have to seize power. <laughs> so sometimes, obviously, and importantly, mm -hmm. that's the way neighborhoods organize for things that will improve neighborhood conditions. Mm -hmm. uh, and sometimes, uh, you know, creating relationships across neighborhoods. I can tell you right now, there is a black woman here in central Brooklyn where I live. Um, she is someone I met on the campaign trail because he, I, I happened to have been at an event, got on the subway. She got on the subway, looked at me and said, you're my Wiley. And I was like, how did you know? <laughs> I mean, we had masks on. Was, right. And she, she said, oh, I know, I know you. And we talked, but she had, she lost her home. Mm -hmm. Her family, this is a common story. Brooklyn has, Brooklyn Black community has the highest rates of foreclosures and yeah. sometimes just flat out property theft uh, in the city, mm -hmm. right? And in a city that's already challenged by a long history of discrimination, housing and home ownership. And we know that that was the path to the middle class for so many folks and so many folks of color, particularly black, Latino, denied them, right? Those opportunities. But here's the point. She didn't just say, dang, I lo we lost our family home. Mm -hmm. She started organizing in central Brooklyn around holding on to homes. There is a fight going on right now um, around an apartment building where folks are, uh, a, a home where people are, are actually organizing together to try to save that home. Yeah. And so, and and it's and it's grassroots. It's mm -hmm. neighborhoody, um, and it is very specific about the fact that Black people are losing what they had, and it ain't right. Uh, mm -hmm. Something I heard constantly about. But these are also the people who were telling me what they needed, what the problems were, and what they needed if I had one. Mm -hmm. But but that is the point. It, it it's not just whether you have someone in office, and and even having someone in office still, even a friendly person needs to be told. This is what we need. This is what's happening. And this is what will fix it for us. Mm -hmm. um, but it can't happen. And, and there are things that people can do to save homes, even without elected officials being engaged when they're mm -hmm. organized. So mm -hmm. I'm just using that as one example. Right. There are many others. There's examples on homelessness front. There are examples mm -hmm. of how people are organized around education in schools mm -hmm. um, and, and even around hunger. <laughs> um, so, so everything we do that helps take care of folks and meets them where they are mm -hmm. and helps them solve and, and, and supports them and, and or supports their engagement solving their own problems is power. Right. Um, and that power is also usually what translates, because I'm gonna tell you that same woman, mm -hmm. she was an activist on my campaign. I mean, she was knocking doors, she was, she was, she was finding who would support and listen to the issues she was already fighting about. And she was using her power in that way around other ways to get power to help her in that fight. And that really is the way we link all the places where we can and should have power. I think about the the, you know, every generation takes on the mantle in a different way, right? And we say, this is what our movement work is going to look like. And so I think sometimes we think about these as evolutions of what's your place in the struggle, right? What is the place that you sit in, right? So are you the person sitting in the back with the strategy and the vision? Are you front line? And I guess I would love for us, especially in, when this, in this particular setting, as we're talking with an audience of young people, how do we help support them to be the leaders? 
in this work, right? They, they've not needed us in terms of the Black Lives. Like they have, Black Lives Movement said, we demand, right? They took, right. They took ownership, they stood up and they said, we demand. The, the climate justice movement too. It's the not climate a, justice a, movement. <laughs> what is the role of all of us in our different positionality to support this work? Um, you know, I, I, I want to make sure we're speaking to people and with people so that we can invite them into conversation. Yeah, I, I, I think that's such an important question. And one of the, I'm going to answer by starting with the first part of what you said, Melanie, because it was so important. You know, we all have different roles to play. And by the way, sometimes we play multiple roles. There are roles shift over time, right? And I actually think of leadership as not something that is always upfront and forward. Mm -hmm. um, you know, a, there's leadership that's actually standing at the back too, right? <laughs> because leadership has many different dimensions to it. Yeah. Um, so, so leadership to me, and one of the things my parents taught me, and it was a really core principle to in in the movement for them is you have to recognize that the people who are impacted mm -hmm. um, have to have the voice. It's not just I, I always felt uncomfortable when people would say. Um, thank you for speaking for the voiceless, because my mm -hmm. response was, they're not. That's right. It's, are we listening? That's right. Um, and so I think that's the same. I would apply that same lens when we're talking about young people already taking leadership mm -hmm. is, are we listening? Right. Uh, and we all have a role to play. You know, I think they're, they're in every, every, every movement, there, there are tensions between generations, right? Mm -hmm. Because there's, there's a level of experience and or history or viewpoint that comes from being the generation that saw what Ronald Reagan did. And there's a boldness and a refusal to accept status quo that every movement has and needs, usually in young people, right? right. I mean, that, that is true. That was true in the fight against the Vietnam War. Right. That was true in SNCC in the civil rights That's movement. Right. It really mattered to have young folks saying to the old heads, we know, and I count myself an old head now, right? Mm -hmm. We know you have something to share, mm -hmm. but it doesn't mean we're going to accept what you consider the limits to be. Right. And I think that is a conversation that has to be approached for those of us who are, you know, who, who have been around for a while and have viewpoints about the work and what can get done and how it can get done is want, and, and I'm one who will always share my viewpoint, my opinion. <laughs> uh, well, because I think we need to, right? And I, but I always wanna be checked. My mm -hmm. kids check me, um, my, they do. I have 21 and 18 year old, they check me. And, <laughs> and, I, and I have valued that yes. Yes. because it helps me re-examine whether I have accepted something that should not be accepted. Right. And I think that is actually part of how we support the next generation is recognize collaboration and, and, and support includes honesty, mm -hmm. includes sharing. Mm -hmm. It includes disagreement. By the way, disagreement is not the problem. Mm -hmm. no. The problem is not coming to conclusions about how to move together even if there is disagreement, because right. in every single phase of the racial justice movement or the mm -hmm. economic justice movement or any of the movements we've had in this country, there has been disagreement. Absolutely. And in every single instance is messy, is sometimes it's some fights, <laughs> <laughs> yes. words, but that's not the issue. The issue is that you hang together and say, but we got to get this done. Mm -hmm. And here's what we can agree on. And here's what we get. And to have the courage of our convictions mm -hmm. to to listen enough and say i hear and i'm a back down now mm -hmm. because that needs to be put front and center and i think that's a key part of actually being an effective leader mm -hmm. um, no matter your age or where you are in the work so that you know you've done a lot of work around allies i want to focus a moment on this question about how do you keep driving when there's disagreement? And I'm going to take the allies out of the conversation for a moment because, you know, Black political thought, there's always been, to your point, disagreement. We go back to the debates of Du Bois and Booker T. Like, this is not a well, new we, thing. We're right? going to be as separate as the fingers on right. the Right. <laughs> and the question has always been, and oh, but if you're in the nation of Islam, you can't have a Christian base, right? We've always had this disagreement about, well, we're not a monolith. Black people are not a monolith. And yet, and then there's been the argument about, well, we have these larger goals around 
voter rights or, you know, which have often been framed around respectability politics, we're honest about it, and left out issues around, you know, uh, uh, LGBTQ rights. So there's been these different issues about how do we bring together the community collectively? How do we work on collective issues? How do you define collective issues? How do you have an agenda? I'm really curious about your thoughts on that. Well, you know, what I've seen, mm-hmm. uh, what I've seen over the years, in me- and I mean, I saw it as a child in my parents' work. Uh, I saw, you know, I, so I, I, I say this when I say I've seen, I'm not counting just what I've done. I'm counting also what I've seen and what I've seen others do yeah. uh, as, well, as well as what I've experienced. Um, like the School Diversity Advisory Group where we did not walk in the door all agreeing. Uh, and that was not our charge, <laughs> but we, so, but, but here's it, but I, no matter what the work, the, the, the I think the common denominator mm-hmm. um, that helps folks work effectively, even in disagreement is what's the outcome? Right. What are we trying to change that are actually people's everyday life experience? You know, I mean, this is why something like police brutality is with whatever all the range of viewpoints are like, boy should have pulled up his pants. I mean, I don't like hearing that, but you know, let's face it, you know, we hear that in our community or should have been this or should have been more yeah. respectful or, and yeah. you're going, mm, um, should we have school, you know, police in schools? Disagreement in the black community. But at the root, it's should our kids be safe from police violence? The answer is hundred percent. Yeah, I haven't heard the person yet who says no, right? right? If the answer is, should you be able to own a home? The answer is always yes, 100%. If the question is, should you be able to afford to go to college? Mm-hmm. The answer is always yes, right? There's, not, there's no disagreement mm-hmm. on, I, I think I have never, ever, ever heard disagreement on the outcomes we're trying to achieve. Mm-hmm. The disagreements are usually the how okay. or, what the, or, or, or the viewpoints about what the understanding what the problem is that's getting in the way of those achievements. Right. But usually, if we're really just being honest with, are we going to make a difference in, in people's lives? I, I remember, for those of you who watched Selma, right? Uh, DuVernay's like brilliant yeah. feature film on, yeah. on, which got us the Voting Rights Act in 1965. Mm-hmm. Okay. If, if, you know, there's this key point in the movie, which is actually true, right? it's, <laughs> a, it's not, it's, it's historically accurate, which is sur- summary, dramatized maybe, but mm-hmm. John Lewis is young. He's a kid mm-hmm. in my view. I mean, he's like, I don't know, 21. I forgot how old he is. Right. And, 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 he, and he, is, he has, they have been organizing on voting rights and voter registration. Mm-hmm. Dr. King and his, and his captains come in and the young folks are saying, get out of here. We got, this is our fight. We've been here for two years, y'all parachuting in. And there's a point at which John Lewis turns to his compatriots and says, y'all, here's the point. We've been doing this for two years. We haven't won anything. Maybe we should listen. Mm-hmm. And, but, so, but the point was they wanted the same outcome. Right. They wanted, right. they had some disagreements, but they wanted mm-hmm. the same outcome. And, and, it, and it caused us to come together and, and, you know, and that, that becomes, that becomes the, 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 the march that becomes right. one of the, one of the pillars. And it isn't because Dr. King made it so, right. uh, but the ability to step back and say, let's look at what we have been doing. Let's look at what has worked. Let's look what hasn't. Mm-hmm. And let's figure out if there's some things we can agree on to do together. Cause it doesn't have to be that we agree on everything. Mm-hmm. Um, if we agree on the outcome should be black, both can register and vote. Uh, so that's just, uh, uh, an, a, a, uh, it ain't, there's nothing simple about that example, but, but, but simple, at least in, in the historic yeah. telling. And, right. I, and I just think that that ultimately, it's if we're really, really direct and honest with each other about what are we trying, what's going to be different in somebody's mm-hmm. life who's Black, Definitely. that's our account. It's also how we're accountable to ourselves as well as to others. Mm-hmm. Um. Shirley Chisholm said, racism is so universal in this country, so widespread and deep that it's invisible. It is normal. (laughs) (laughs) We think about the work that we do as individuals as coming together as community. How do we move institutions forward? 
you've started them, you've worked in them, you've led them. How do we move institutions? I, I really think, you know, there's several different different principles that I've already said that are that apply whether you're working in community or whether you're working in large institutions or small institutions or across institutions mm -hmm. or in government. Mm -hmm. It's principles, mm -hmm. right? It has to be principled, mm -hmm. but, but setting those principles out. Um, it's one of the things we started with in the School Diversity Advisory Group, yeah. you know, was as 42 people coming together different races, different backgrounds. Some were parents and it wasn't their day job. We had students, we had academics, we had activists and advocates. I mean, we had, it was a, it was a wide variety of people. We started with principles um, of, and those, some of that was how, what, how mm -hmm. we would, what we were accountable to to one another, but also to that point about what, what are we trying to achieve? What is our measurable, mm -hmm. but not for us personally. What is right. our measurable out there in the world? Right. What is it that we're trying to achieve with whatever we uh, end up agreeing on here? So how are we holding ourselves accountable to what we're supposed to be producing out there in the world for others? Mm -hmm. um, and that, that, that was, and then there had to be accountable leadership, yeah. right? So I, I was one of three, three co-chairs. Um, but we were the leadership that then had to hold the accountability of, for ourselves as leaders, but also for the group on the principles and what we'd agreed to and what the outcomes were. Mm -hmm. And it really actually built trust. Uh, mm -hmm. It held us together through our disagreements. Mm -hmm. um, and it got us to a point where, we, you know, I would say, it, it, I, I would call it successful. And I would call it successful not because the work is done, but in terms of being able to work together and that, that those, I've seen that work inside institutions. I've seen that work across institutions. Yeah. And when it falls down, because this is what I'm sure people out there are saying, yeah, but that doesn't, it's not that it doesn't work. It's that yeah. usually they're, as in all struggle, mm -hmm. as in, and everything is struggle. Mm -hmm. Power sees nothing. <laughs> But but again, coming back when it when it falls down, coming yeah. back to that strategic analysis about okay, was it a departure from the pr principles? Is there an accountability we need to hold people accountable to who fell down mm -hmm. on in terms of what they were accountable for? Mm -hmm. You know, it's there are still tools that you that, that can be utilized mm -hmm. to call and try to pull the institution back. And it, part of accountability in, in, includes challenge sometimes. Right. It does, um, but I think it has to be a principal challenge, and it has to be about accountability to the to the to the you know to the to the outcomes for other people always. Mm -hmm. uh, and and when and when that happens, it's, it sometimes takes a long time, and it's sometimes hard. And I will say, in the absence of committed leadership, it can be really long. Um, but that's take why. That's why power matters. <laughs> power matters, power matters. I'm gonna take one quick question and then I'm gonna let you jump because I know you have many things. Um, okay. One question, I'm gonna combine them. This is, this is in reference to black people serving essentially as the canary in America, a okay. canary in the minefield. And it's the question of, do we think that the recent Alabama case that went to the Supreme Court is basically serving as a canary of the rights that we're going to be, we're gonna to start to see the disenfranchisement of other populations that don't we have, have power. We mm -hmm. already have. Right. We don't have to look forward to this. Right. All we have to look, you go back to 2010 when Alec, right, the Koch brothers funded corporate backed think tank started promulgating state legislation to make it harder to vote. Right. Look, it's impacted Native Americans. It's impacted the elderly. Mm -hmm. Look at the, uh, it's impacted young people mm -hmm. who are it's and it and it's impacted uh, obviously blacks, Latinos. And, and so it's the it's already there. Okay. And every time we do something that makes it harder for black people or Latinos or Native Americans to vote is harder for elderly. It's I don't mean there aren't other issues. There are physical accessibility issues that people with disabilities have, that elderly okay. may have. So I don't mean that it, I'm not trying to roll it all up into one ball. We have mm -hmm. to attend to everyone's access and needs. Yeah. But it is also true that as we're as we're seeing this rhetoric around, and the big lie around voter fraud and all these other things, 
uh, making it more difficult to vote is making it more difficult for lots of folk to vote. And it's like a, 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 a friend and mentor of mine, John Powell used to say, you know, folks go, folks go, <laughs> Folks go fishing for tuna, but they will catch some dolphin in their mouth. <laughs> that's right. And that's, we've been seeing that's that right. for years. But that's it's right. also the, the reverse is also true. Yes. When we do things to expand access for people who've been discriminated against, we now only expand it for them. We ended up, we end up expanding it for a wide swath of people across race, across zip code, across all kinds of things. So yeah. Maya, <laughs> you have been a friend, a leader, and a mentor, and I appreciate you. I thank you for all that you do here today. I thank you for all you do in the community. I want to thank well, you. Well, thank you. you. Thank you. I can say the same back, and y'all don't know this, but I have relied on Melanie as a leader for a long time from city government <laughs> to the new school and to the new school community, my home. I'm, a, I'm, I'm away from home, but you will always be a home. And for all that you do, uh, because I know so many people on this Zoom um, new school and not new school who just came to listen. It's, it's an us. It ain't, it's an us and we got to get it done. So thank you for all you do. Thank you so much. All right. Be I'll well. see you on MSNBC tonight. Yes. In 10 minutes. <laughs> in 10 minutes literally a few minutes. <laughs> Have a good one. Yeah. Thank you.